Hello everyone, this is Darren here with Creativity Unleashed and today I want you to join me on my quest as we seek to develop the highest quality, lowest cost housing that can be made. I hope you guys find this extremely interesting. There is a whole lot to learn in the process of building houses. There is infinite things you can really do with them and it's been an incredible learning experience and there is so much more that I have to try out now that I've gotten as far as I have. So you guys enjoy, have fun, feel free to leave comments and questions below and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the new videos in the series. up to 312 square feet there'll be a lofted space so that will add to the square footage so it will be under 400 square feet but pretty near there um, right now I'm trying to do a build that is extremely long-lasting very durable almost no maintenance and out of good quality material and I'm trying to see how economically I can actually do this uh, my goal is about six or seven thousand dollars for the entire finished space and I want everything to be um, highly efficient. I already got the air conditioner, I got a good quality split unit and um, most of all the bathroom fittings and fixtures and things and I've got the frame done here. I'm going to show you what's going on. This frame here is all based on an eight inch um, depth of joist and um, siding. So this here, the outer frame is a big C channel that I had bent out of 332nd sheet metal. And then I added bars into it to turn it into a reinforced um, channel section. And that way I get a nice finished look on the outside. On the inside, these are all inch and a half by eighth inch angle iron with three eighths webbing and that is extremely strong and quite economical to build. Um, they come out to I think it was around $26 each and I put them at three foot spacing because I'm using pretty hefty um, roofing here as the decking and I'm planning to potentially add some mesh or something to help the cement stick to it a little better. Put in a lot of screws. So right now the cost is up to about 700 and some dollars for the framework and the decking. And it's, um, I have it on scaffolding wheels for the convenience of building it. And I just added a piece of pipe and I have the adjustable height scaffolding wheels. That way I can move it around. All that's nice and convenient. Uh, there it is. So I think if I did it again, I would do it on a two foot center and potentially make them even a little lighter weight. These are extremely strong. And of course, one of the reasons that they're the same on the top and bottom is that it's designed to be able to carry the load on a trailer because this house is designed for a specialized trailer so that it can be moved later. One of the challenges you run into designing a tiny house is the ceiling heights limitation, especially if you're trying to have a lofted bedroom, um, you want to be able to go up as high as possible while still keeping it under the road limit of like 14 feet. So I think if I do it again, I would make it only six inch um, depths of bar choice instead of eight inch. Of course, eight inch is very convenient to work with, but um, you do lose a few inches of potential ceiling heights in your loft space. So right here, I'm getting started on the foundations. These are just pieces of rebar that are bent into L shapes. And I also bent some rings I believe out of quarter inch and those are going every about I think eight inches or something like that and we're getting those all welded in place and these um, will of course carry the whole load of the house and it's really neat because it utilizes very little material the four foundations I think came out to a little over a hundred some dollars finished and I'm just using shielded metal arc welding. These are 6013 welding electrodes, eighth inch ones at right at about 100 amps, and that tends to run those quite well. 
So of course one of the complicated parts is attaching the bolts to the rebar and making it where you still can pour the concrete. So I ended up drilling holes in the plates and putting the bolts through and then welding heavy um, bars to the back end and then those get attached along with the ring to the rebar and that comes out really strong, works well. So here's the base for the tiny house and we are working on the foundations. I'm sticking with like um, standard pier foundations like you find in pretty big structures, um, but I'm just made miniature form. So I use some cardboard that screen came in and that's about five inches and we'll center those. They'll be lifted up, of course. We'll put in about four inches of concrete into the bottom. Just weld these up, took about a day to do all four. And um, this is a 12 foot wide um, house. And yeah, so we're just doing four foundations. And over here, we'll show you guys the concrete getting mixed up. So you can see we're mixing the concrete by hand and that looks very primitive, but we actually ended up weighing out exact amounts of sand, gravel, and cement, and water and we are mixing it up extremely well so it's going to achieve the same results as buying a high-end mix and this is um i think m25 concrete for the entire thing i'm also cutting a little corner here by adding rocks into the base but i'm just being very careful where i'm placing them and that of course takes up more space it means you use a little less concrete while still achieving almost the same result. Probably wouldn't meet code but in some areas, but it should work out perfectly fine for what this is. Of course, you wouldn't do that in a column. The strength of concrete is greatly dictated by the amount of water you add to concrete, so as little as you can is best. So we got the foundations poured, got the little columns done. We filled it in with, these are all M25 concrete here and it came out extremely solid um so there it is at the bottom that's what it looks like um, i just used um, a metal bars going across here they're really solid welded to the rebar as uh, what's holding the bolts in place so one of the advantages when you do this is you're able to just drop nuts on it and level them so that when you put the post up here you actually have it properly leveled, right on level in both directions. So we'll get these put on and get them tightened down and then we'll be checking it with the laser level across from one another to ensure that they are precise. one of the things I did not show in the video is the cure process is very important to maintain the moisture so they doesn't dry out and the temperature of the concrete while it's curing so I covered them in bags and of course when the concrete was poured I used a drill to vibrate the columns just enough you don't want to over vibrate them but enough to make sure there's no air pockets in them as well so right here is the model of the roof line of the tiny house. Here is the drawing I did with all dimensions and angles and all. And I just did it out of wood real quick to double check everything to make sure all the angles were correct and that I liked how everything looked. So we'll just be doing this out of three inch square tubing now. So of course I'm using the LS 1800 miter bandsaw, one of the few companies that still makes bandsaws in America. They are extremely well built and probably would last several lifetimes and it makes the cutting of angles and all your metal things very convenient so highly recommend them. But of course you could probably use a Milwaukee Porta Band or you could use just an angle grinder is what I end up using for a lot of this type of work. So you can see we're getting all the metal pieces out on site and we are just utilizing the base of the house for building it. Um, since it's nice and square and flat and level, we're able to just um, lay the pieces and hang them off the edge. And I'm using some roller supports that are adjustable hikes to level and ensure that everything's straight and parallel and all of the good things. Of course, if I was doing this again, now that I have the design more completed, I might add a lot more pieces and stand the walls up more finished but I was still working out where windows would go and door openings and all those kind of details. So I decided I would just 
play it safe and um, put it together um, one piece at a time sort of method, which usually, of course, takes a bit longer, but um, in the end works out well for when you're still prototyping and trying to figure out everything you can move forward. So originally I was planning to just use metal studs on top of the metal base and that would probably come out more economical than using tubing, at least where I'm purchasing my materials. The issue I um, was worried about would be that if I was moving it later that it may not be as structurally as sound as a welded construction out of metal tubing and the price difference was sort of minimal and so I'm kind of doing a hybrid solution between the two whereas the main structure is all uh, metal tubing welded together so a nice welded construction that should keep things um, pretty stable and rigid and then filling in with metal studs to um, lower the cost a little bit. It is definitely an option to just uh, build the entire thing out of welded construction one of the key factors to keep in mind when building with metal, besides having to know how to weld and cut it and work with it, which honestly, once you um, understand and are able to work with it, is probably easier. So some of the problems that do occur with metal structures in general is condensation problems because of how quickly the temperature can change outside of the house can cause um, condensation inside of walls and some of that, as well as thermal bridging where, of course, the heat from the sun just goes right through the metal members right into the house. And so then you have a very poor insulation value. So simply insulating between the cavities in the walls tend to still make for a very inefficient house. And the usual solution to that is exterior insulation, which is what I am planning to do, as well as adding a rail on the top and bottom of the sides of the house where that I can lash bamboo to it that will have uh, several inches of air gap between the metal siding and the bamboo, which will should keep the direct sunlight from ever hitting the metal siding on a large percentage of the house area, give it a really cool look, and bamboo is almost free and grows so easily that in 10, 15 years, whenever it gets um, looking bad, we can replace that so right now we're adding in the members that are supporting the lofted bedroom. And you may be wondering why I'm not using wood very much on this construction. Here in the tropics, wood has really big termite problems. Of course, wood can catch fire. Tornadoes tend to turn it into matches. And it just doesn't seem like a building material of the modern time. So I really prefer things that are more durable and less dangerous to live in. So you can see right here we're adding in the X brace that will add a whole lot of stiffness and rigidity to the house and the lofted bedroom. And one thing to keep in mind is grass fires. I just started one there by sparks from either grinding or welding. So it's always important to have fire extinguishers or water around on hand. And that's another reason not to build a house out of wood. So one of the complications of adding in X braces is that it makes it a lot slower to fill in the studs and that wastes a lot of time and of course putting electrical or other things into the walls means a lot more drilling and cutting to be able to run your lines through but in this scenario we're going to be running most things under the floor and then up into the walls and so that shouldn't be too much of an issue so another way you can do bracing is with steel cables and turnbuckles and putting the correct tension on things. And those can be done after the studs are installed. And that's something I may try further in the future. So you can see on top of the X, the frame there is going to be the lofted section of the bedroom. And you can see I'm adding in another piece and this is going at the same height as the floor of the bedroom. And the Hikes of that is right at the standard hikes of doorways because I needed to um, keep the, the ceiling hikes under the, um, the lofted space as low as I could while still making it very usable. So it's I think around 80 inches and that makes it where the doors will fit right in underneath that pipe, piece of tubing that I'm welding into place right now. So one of the things you may be wondering is why I chose to use metal roofing as a subfloor. Some of the thought process in that is that it's moisture proof and bug and rodent proof for the most part. And leaving the webbing underneath the bar joist all open allows for putting in plumbing and electrics and whatever upgrades I need to do later. 
um, should be pretty easy. I'm planning to put styrofoam or spray foam insulation underneath it and that should work um, with keeping the floor very insulated. I can either do um, like the porcelain on top of styrofoam in some cement and mesh or um, I could also if I was making a different version put um, wood um, flooring right on top of this or some of the heavier duty vinyl flooring could go on top of the metal with no issues. You can see the lofted section is almost completed. I actually purchased hardwood for that because hardwood is very beautiful um, for flooring and will make a really great platform for laying the mattress on. There's numerous ways to make the stairs up to the lofted bedroom and I'm still working out which one of those will be best. On to getting the roofing finished, I was putting quite a bit of thought into how it would work out best and I decided to go with more of a joist and I'm using one by two rectangular lightweight square tubing and these are just being turned of course into a simple joist. I'm utilizing a heavy six inch C channel to keep everything nice and straight and to clamp to. I'm also using my heavy duty precision welding table that I made in another video. Here you can see I'm doing a bundle cut of the pieces that are making the spacing on the bar joist and um, doing bundle cuts keeps everything really accurate and allows you to cut a whole lot at the same time. So of course here I'm just MIG welding everything and I'm using straight CO2 is what I always pretty much use for MIG welding. It costs a lot less and um, works out really well. And of course when you're doing a lot of these type of things, MIG welding saves a whole lot of time and on thin metal works out way better. Um, it's very important to clamp everything. The heat of welding tends to want to distort things a lot and if you're able to keep things clamped well, usually they stay really straight and it works out extremely well. So of course here you can see we're spraying on some paint, which is of course really important to keep the rust down. It's definitely a lot easier to do it on the ground, but of course when welding them in place, the paint is always a little bit of a nuisance to deal with, but it's still a lot easier than um, having to paint it in position. You definitely can do a much better job on the ground. And also, I believe these cost right around $300 in materials to do all of the rough um, joists slash trusses um, that are supporting the ceiling. So of course, I always use a lot of clamps and blocks of wood and stuff to help hold the material where I need it before I'm able to get a weld on it. And that always works out really well, keeps things really accurate. Harbor Freight makes some really nice heavy welding clamps and I tend to use those all the time now. So of course here we're setting in the little bar joists and um, getting those all welded into position. These are on 16 inch centers as well and it is definitely close together but that's going to work out better for the drywall if we hang that off the ceiling and it also is going to make sure that even whatever hurricane comes your way the roofing should stay right on. And these are also serving the purpose of purlins, so I won't need to add any purlins on the top of the house. These are doing both the both functions, and they worked out extremely well and went into place quite rapidly. And I don't think I'd change anything about that. It works out extremely well. So of course, having a really strong roof is also very advantageous for when you're installing solar panels, which I should be doing on this project, as well as a solar water heater is the plan. And that way we'll keep the house's energy costs extremely low and make for a very comfortable, low cost of living house. As of now, this house is designed around having more time than money. So trying to save as much money and time is not the biggest part of the equation and it's prototyping so it's going to take a lot of time. And I am planning to just install purlins around the entire outside, probably one by twos out of that really thin metal tubing that comes out quite economical. And then I'm going to use outside insulation, styrofoam. I'm planning to notch it out around the purlins but where it probably will be at least two inches of styrofoam in the majority. Of it and that way I won't have the thermal bridging with the metal roofing that I'm going to use as the siding and so there'll only be the heat transfer through the screws and of course through the glass and frames of the windows so that should definitely conserve a lot on energy make the house a lot more comfortable 
and I can of course insulate the cavities between the studs as well from the inside. So as you can see here, I've been working on some of the framing on the tiny house and I wanted to show you the corner details a little bit. Since this is three by three tubing that the outside's made out of and the studs here are about three and five eighths, it means that I need to do a bit of a offset from it. So what I ended up doing is cutting some three quarter inch wood spacers and putting them in and that way I ensure that the inside corner is cracked for hanging drywall if I end up using drywall of course. Um, so I got the top and bottom put in with these um, the bottom part of the like trough closer up detail of that. So it is truly amazing and incredible to build your own house. There is so much to learn. There's so much to um, improve on. There's so many details that I want to now try out. I am definitely on a journey to try to figure out what is like the best low cost housing. And so this is part of that journey of discovering what works the best and um, just trying out a lot of different methods and being free to just think of something talk with friends and build it and make it happen and turn it into a reality. So I hope you guys follow around along with the rest of the build videos that will hopefully be coming out soon. Um, I still have a good ways to go, but hopefully we'll have it done soon. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys in the next one.